Good evening and welcome. Welcome to the Embassy of Canada for the 15th annual Seymour Martin Lipset Lecture on Democracy in the World. Bienvenue à l'Ambassade du Canada. My name is Martin Loken, Minister of Political Affairs here at the Embassy, and it really is an honour to be hosting this event this evening. Among our many distinguished guests, I would like to recognize and thank Sid Lipset for joining us this evening. It's fitting that the Embassy of Canada hosts this event each year. As many of you will, you will know, Professor Lipset devoted much of his career to research in Canada as a way to gain insight to democratic developments in the United States and the world. And Canada and the United States certainly have much in common in terms of our histories of support for human rights, democracy, and the rule of law around the world. We now find ourselves at a time when many experts feel an overall retreat in democracy around the world. This is why promoting democracy, a long time integral part of Canada's foreign policy and international assistance, has never been more important. It's also why we need to listen to and learn from courageous, principled leaders like Mr. Anwar. Mr. Anwar will be formally introduced in a moment, but let me just say now that Canada is proud to have shown support throughout his lengthy trials and imprisonment. Our diplomats were a noted and regular presence in court. Former Prime Minister Paul Martin, who had gotten to know Mr. Anwar when they were both ministers of finance during the Asian financial crisis, publicly voiced his support during this difficult time, as did many other prominent Canadians. Fortunately, our efforts and those of the U.S. and other countries to support Mr. Anwar, a key voice representing democratic principles and the rule of law, were not in vain. He's now a free man, a man who has led and will continue to have a profound influence on Malaysia and beyond. With its peaceful transition of power and efforts to reform laws and institutions for the benefit of all Malaysians, Malaysia now stands out as a much needed democratic success story in an international landscape grappling with a surge in authoritarianism. Canada congratulates Mr. Anwar on the impact he has had on Malaysia and looks forward to working together to bring about a better future for both of our countries as we strive to bolster the international rules-based order. In a moment, I'll pass the floor to Mark Platner of the National Endowment for Democracy. The NED is, of course, our wonderful partner for this event this evening. We're pleased to have a long-standing relationship with the NED, an organization that has done much to grow and strengthen democratic institutions around the world. And this annual event helps further deepen our thinking in the US and Canada on democratic trends and how we can improve the quality of our democracies. So now I'd ask you to please welcome Mark Platner, co-editor of the NED's Journal of Democracy, to the stage. Mark. Uh, thank you, Martin, for those uh, generous words. Uh, and it's my pleasure as well to welcome all of you tonight on behalf of the National Endowment for Democracy. This is the 15th annual Seymour Martin Lipset Lecture on Democracy in the World, a program that now has had a long and distinguished history. Uh, the annual Lipset Lecture is given twice, once in the United States and once in Canada. Tonight's Washington pro Lecture is a joint project of the National Endowment for Democracy and the Canadian Embassy, which provides a splendid auditorium in which you're now sitting and host the reception that will follow. Later this week, our speaker tonight, Anwar Ibrahim, will travel to Canada to present a version of his lecture at the Monk School for Global Affairs and Public Policy of the University of Toronto. This fruitful Canadian-American partnership honors the legacy of Seymour Martin Lip Lipset, one of the greatest social scientists of the second half of the 20th century. Uh, as uh, Minister Loken mentioned, he was one of a lifelong student of Canadian politics and society, even sometimes dubbed the Tocqueville of Canada. And he was always intrigued by the similarities, but also the differences between Canada and, Uni and the United States, 
the subject of one of his books, Continental Divide. The scope of Marty Lipsitz's in, Lipsitz interest was vast. One small indication of this can be found in a set of booklets that you may have seen near the entrance to the auditorium tonight. In connection with the topics of some of the past lectures, Marty's widow, Sidney, organized the printing of these elegant little volumes drawn from a few of Marty's noteworthy articles and book chapters. Their titles, Some Social Requisites of Democracy, Anticipations of the Failure of Communism, The First New Nation, Racial and Ethnic Conflicts, A Global Perspective, and Democracy and Working Class Authoritarianism, uh, reveal the scholarly range of Lipset's work, as well as the diversity of topics that's been covered in this lecture series. And I particularly want to call to your attention the short memoir entitled Steady Work, which provides a fascinating autobiographical account of Lipset's professional career and of the evolution of his thought. So I want to thank Sidney Lipset uh, for the production of these booklets, as well as for our friendship and all our other contributions to the success of this lecture series. Others who deserve thanks for their role in tonight's event, including those at the Canadian Embassy, Martin Loken for his opening remarks, his colleagues, especially Victoria Benner and Adrian Rooney, and National Endowment for Democracy staff members, Melissa Ayton and Andrea Blazanovich. We're extremely grateful for the generous support of the Johns Hopkins University Press, which publishes the endowment's Journal of Democracy. And we're pleased to acknowledge the presence here tonight, I think he's here, of Bill Breitner, who's the head of the journal's division. Also deeply appreciated is the support of the Shar School of Politics and Government at George Mason University where Marty spent the last years of his academic career. And representing the Shar School here tonight is Judith Wilde. If you look at the list of past Lipset lectures included in the program, you'll see that they've been primarily academics, with one notable exception, former Brazilian president Fernando Enrique Cardoso, who opened the series in 2004. This year, we have again turned to a leading political figure as our speaker, Malaysian parliamentarian, party leader, and likely future prime minister, Anwar Ibrahim. Anwar also has been a visiting professor at Georgetown, at SAIS, and at Oxford University. And he's written widely on key issues of democratic thought. In fact, we've published him twice in the Journal of Democracy including a very impressive essay he wrote in 2006 entitled Universal Values and Muslim Democracy. One drawback of inviting active political figures, however, is that their schedules are very unpredictable. For those of you who may have wondered why the Lipset Lecture was not held in the fall as usual this time, the answer is that it was originally planned for that time of year uh, but had to be postponed because of the vagaries of the Malaysian parliamentary calendar. We're confident, however, that Anwar's talk will prove to have been well worth waiting for. And now I'm pleased to call on NED President Carl Gershman, who will have the honor of introducing his longtime friend Anwar Ibrahim. After the lecture, I'll return to the podium to moderate the question and answer session. Thank you, Mark, Minister Loken, Sid Lipset. I want to say what an absolutely extraordinary honor it is for me to introduce Anwar Ibrahim this evening to give the 15th annual Lipset Lecture on Democracy. It's also a great personal pleasure for me to welcome Anwar back to Washington. I first met Anwar in 2005 when he arrived in Washington after spending five years as Malaysia's most famous political prisoner. He was already a major 
international figure recognized for his role as a reform-minded political leader, a Muslim Democrat, and an activist defending the rights of poor people and minorities. He was first arrested in 1974 and spent 20 months in prison for, for leading student protests against rural poverty and hunger. He headed the Muslim youth movement of Malaysia back then and co-founded in 1981 the International Institute of Islamic Thought. His career took a dramatic turn in 1982 when he joined the Ruli Umno party that was headed at the time by Prime Minister Mahathir bin Mohammed. Anwar's star rose quickly as he was appointed to a number of government ministerial posts, including Minister of Education. He was made finance minister in 1991 and became Mahathir's deputy prime minister two years later. He was credited with promoting market reforms that spurred Malaysia's rapid economic growth in the 1990s. And he was hailed for successfully guiding Malaysia through the Asia financial crisis of 1997. Asia Money named Anwar Finance Minister of the Year in 1996, and he was Newsweek's Asian of the Year in 1998. But Anwar's political fortunes soon changed when he launched a bold attack on the culture of cronyism and nepotism within the UNMO coalition, and also challenged Mahathir's protectionist policies. He was fired from the cabinet and then arrested, beaten, and sentenced to prison on trumped up charges of corruption and sodomy. Almost as soon as Anwar arrived in Washington in 2005, after his release from prison, he became a core member of our community of democracy intellectuals and advocates. He spoke at numerous forums that we organized here in Washington, in New York, and abroad. He wrote two articles, as Mark said, for the Journal of Democracy. He gave keynote addresses at two global assemblies of the World Movement for Democracy, one held in Istanbul in 2006 and the other in Jakarta in 2010. And he delivered an eloquent talk at a symposium we held at the Library of Congress in 2007 on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of President Reagan's Westminster Address that launched the creation of the National Endowment for Democracy. In all of these speeches, Anwar defended the universality of the democratic idea and systematically refuted the various doctrines that were circulating at the time, making the case for authoritarianism. These doctrines included what he called the Asian values mantra, claiming that democracy is a Western idea unsuited to Asian cultures, the view that Islam and democracy are inherently incompatible, and the argument now being promoted prominently by China that human rights and freedom are a stumbling block in the eradication of poverty and that authoritarianism is needed for development. Democracy, Anwar said at the Library of Congress, is not about the choice between starvation and freedom. It is about the freedom to overcome poverty and tyranny without compromising in the struggle against either. Anwar has always been prepared to pay the price for his beliefs. After the opposition coalition that he led was denied vic the victory it had won in the Malaysian general election of 2013, Anwar vowed to lead a fierce movement against election fraud and to reform the country's electoral system. As a result, he was once again sentenced to prison. Anwar didn't mince words in his statement that he made to the judges after the verdict was announced. He accused them of being partners 
with their political masters in the murder of judicial independence and integrity. Yes, he said, you have passed judgment on me and I will again for the third time walk into prison. But rest assured that my head will be held high. The light shines on me, the shame is on you. Going to jail I consider a sacrifice I make for the people of this country. My struggle will continue. And indeed, it has continued. In the historic election held in Malaysia on May 9th last year, the opposition coalition that Anwar negotiated with Mahathir while he was still behind bars swept to a resounding victory as the people of Malaysia revolted against massive corruption. Anwar received a royal pardon and was released from prison. He then stood for and won a by-election that returned him to the parliament. As we meet this evening, Anwar's struggle continues. We don't know if the 93-year-old Mahathir will honor the agreement he made before the election to transfer power to Anwar within two years. We only know that Mahathir is not getting any younger, and we should never underestimate Anwar's political resilience, courage, and determination. Over the years, Anwar has shown a singular ability to turn adversity to advantage, even to find strength in suffering. In his speech at the Library of Congress, he said that throughout these ordeals that he has experienced, my passion for freedom and justice has grown in intensity. Anwar is a rare figure, a political leader who is also a courageous democracy activist and a serious democratic intellectual. Marty Lipset would have felt very, very proud that Anwar is speaking to us tonight in his name. It is now my honor to introduce my dear friend, Anwar Ibrahim, to deliver the 15th annual Seymour Martin Lipset Lecture on Democracy in the World. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin, Sid Lipset, Carl, and friends. Uh, it is a rare privilege and honor, I call it to me and uh, democratic democracy activists in Malaysia throughout the developing the Muslim world. And I must express my profound gratitude thanks to the Canadian government and Carl and the National Endowment for Democracy for the untiring, relentless effort to support democratic transition and efforts throughout the world. I am a student of history and social science and um, said, may I state to you that uh, Simone Lipset is not only known throughout Canada and the United States of America. Uh, is, uh, the concerns of Simone is not just as an academic. I would consider him even as a public intellectual because the issues that he propounds are with strong passion against injustices, authoritarian rule, and dictatorship. So let me begin with a passage from a novel that was written in German, but was first published in English. The original manuscript was thought to have been lost during the writer's escape from Paris in May 1940, 
just before Nazi occupation of France. Our press and our schools cultivate chauvinism, militarism, dogmatism, conformism, and ignorance. The arbitrary power of the government is unlimited and unexampled in history. Freedom of the press, of opinion, and of movement are as thoroughly exterminated as though the proclamation of the rights of man had never been. We have built up the most gigantic police apparatus with informers made a national institution and with the most refined scientific system of political and mental torture. We whip the groaning masses of the country towards a theoretical future happiness which only we can see. Darkness at Noon, Arthur Kusler. An authoritarian government may be defined by a strong central political power with economic power concentrated in the hands of the few. Fundamental liberties are subordinate to the state and there's minimum accountability and transparency, if any, in governmental action. There may be written or in existence a written constitution bereft of a truly independent judiciary. However, there is no guarantee of the rule of law or the protection of political freedoms. Such a state is structured to have a low tolerance to civil society or dissident political parties and interest groups or any other force deemed to be capable of mobilizing opposition against it. Technology and science you'd find are utilized by the state as instruments of control, manipulation, and intimidation. It is not for me to name which country fits this description, but I'm sure we know there are many. There are also many countries that will reject the label. For one, they will lay claim to be a democracy, an account of participation by elections. Granted, there is a starting point, but democracy must be seen more deeply for the qualitative characteristics. There must be some level of equality to create a level playing field. Competitive politics must entail fair access to all parties, to the media and avenues for campaign publicity. There must be electoral accountability, regular, free, and fair elections, which is an impartial, independent electoral commission and unfettered access by all citizens to the ballot box without fear or intimidation. There's also a problem of extreme inequalities in income and knowledge that will favor the perpetuation of the incumbent powers. It is paradoxical that an illegitimate regime gain allegiance among the disadvantaged group by simultaneously exacerbating their need and meeting their demands. This is part and parcel of exploitative politics as practice by incumbent governments to cling on to power for as long as possible. Economic policies are therefore geared towards creating extreme inequalities in wealth distribution so as to enable the powers that be to emerge as the people's savior, which they start di when they start dishing, dishing out cash schemes and ad hoc economic plans. Now, Confronting authoritarianism requires the existence of a fiercely independent judiciary to send a clear message to the other branches of government that the rule of law means legal and judicial processes cannot be used to further the political agenda of the ruling party or a particular personality. For a multiracial, multireligious, multicultural country like Malaysia, Advancing constitutional rights and other legitimate demands 
and the expectations requires great sensitivity and considerations in order to meet competing claims. This is where the politics of expediency will usually be used to justify the hand of authoritarianism over democracy. In this regard, John Rawls reminds us that despite considerable differences in citizens' conception of justice, there can still be consensus provided that these conceptions lead to similar political judgments. This is the principle of overlapping consensus, but the consensus can only be realized by the respective contending parties refraining from cantankerous and open disputes regarding race and religion. If by democracy we mean free market capitalism, inequality will be the inevitable consequence because competition naturally breeds inequality. The answer to this conundrum has to be from top down. No trickle down economics as in the weak justification for so-called collateral benefits from capitalist predators. It has to be social policy in the name of social justice and sustainability, albeit with free market capitalism. Let us be clear about what sustainability really means, lest we deceive ourselves into believing that implementing some greening initiatives means we have made it. A sustainable state is one which is able to provide the basic needs of all its people in such a way that future generations are not denied access to and benefit from a finite set of resources. Among those who look closely at the ebbs and flows of democracy, there's one fact about which there is general consensus, that extreme inequality is incompatible with democracy. In this respect, Piketty's, Thomas Piketty's conclusions are difficult to dispute. It's an advantage of being in prison for a long time because this, we can digest these books better. That while raise, rising inequality is not the inevitable result of capitalism, the manner in which governments pursue growth and implement economic policy can either mitigate or exacerbate the problem. Confronting authoritarianism entails the creation of a system which controls, nay overcomes, the manifestations of capitalism we show a lack of concern for the vast majority of the poor and the working poor from earning gap between workers and executives, minimum wage, that dooms people to a generation of grinding poverty. The provision of medical benefits, better working conditions, financial assistance to workers' families will also be crucial so as to help define the appropriate distribution of the benefits and burdens of social cooperation. If we can no longer be naive about the contradiction between a development agenda that prioritizes growth but ignores inequality, then we must be progressive in the identifying the right policy regime that maximizes sustainability and distributive justice instead of maximizing profits and treating sustainability as a mere afterthought. Since the last two decades, the world witnessed a democratic recession. With the advent of globalization, free trade, the internet, and liberal intervention, the world was supposed to have witnessed the global spread of democracy. Fukuyama spoke of the end of history, extolling the triumph of liberalism over authoritarianism. Although I must concede Fukuyama's latest writings, political economy, takes a rather different, more positive outlook about the need for democratic accountability. But, but such optimism would have been justified by the advent of the Arab Spring but for the fact that spring turned into winter 
of great discontent. The rise of right-wing activism at the beginning of the 21st century is a perverse, bizarre, and deeply troubling recurrence of history. After decades, when generations assume continuing expanding horizons, the global economic crisis of 2008 was an abrupt shock. Since then, there has been an awakening to the stark reality that around the world, ordinary people are struggling to maintain a lifestyle on par with previous generations, while elites amass a greater share of the economic pie. And today, we witness that not only has history not ended, but there has been a revival of authoritarianism. A more insidious form marked by the resurrection of the ghosts of the past made all more sinister because of the trappings of democracy. This descent into authoritarianism under the guise of popular democracy has taken on the eerie cadence and atmosphere not quite different from Dante's opening lines in the Inferno, where we have found ourselves within a forest dark for the straightforward pathway had been lost. And indeed, this is a forest savage, rough and stern. But unlike Dante's fear, which will eventually find redemption, albeit many cantos later, we are caught in the grip of a self-generated fear of the other. The powers that be question the motives intentions and aspirations of people deemed to be different. They are attempting to close borders and building walls of separation with a clarion call to rely on our own identity and to keep away disease in the myriad forms. The solace that people may find in demagoguery is certainly tied to their disdain for a government that has failed to meet the overall needs of the people. In this sense, we must accept the reality that unfettered capitalism can sow the seeds for the unraveling of society unless these pernicious forces are challenged. With xenophobia, ultra-nationalism, raising their ugly heads, we see the anti-immigration discourse transmogrified into racism and the sowing of religious animosity and communal hatred and incitement for violence. I made a call recently at an international forum in the world's largest democracy, India, and I believe it bears repeating. The resurgence of ultra-nationalism is a global phenomenon. It's a precursor to fear and a present danger to global peace and security. Extreme identity politics and polemics contribute to the conditions in which the seductive call to violence festers. We must unequivocally reject it. Well, fortunately today, I stand before you representing a nation that has rejected it. On May 9, 2018, the people of Malaysia, Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, enemies, stood shoulder to shoulder and decisively voted out a regime that has ruled the nation for more than six decades. Indeed, the pen is mightier than the sword, as attested to at the 14th general elections where Malaysians from all communities, cultures, and faith chose to vote into power the alliance of hope, Pakatan Harapan, setting a new dawn for Malaysia. This was indeed the people's victory made all the more glorious by the peaceful transition of power, unprecedented in recent times because we crossed the Rubicon Court a Rubicon without a stone being thrown or a shot being fired. 
despite political pundits and doomsday prophets of the world over who predicted communal violence and chaos in the unlikely event of a new alliance winning the elections. They were proven wrong, thanks indeed to our very firm and consistent position on communal, cultural, and religious inclusivity. It is a clear policy. Reject all forms of extremism and fanaticism, racism and religious bigotry. Celebrate diversity and foster communal and religious harmony. More importantly, we offered something fundamentally different and markedly better than years of race-baiting, corruption, and political decadence. That this change took place in a majority Muslim country is a remarkable development, both in the light of the failure of the Arab Spring, but also in response to, to accusations of the incompatibility between Islam and democracy and the spread of Islamophobia. Nevertheless, even as the new government is doing its best to meet the legitimate expectations of the people, there are still those who would want to see us fail. There must, therefore, be no let-up in our efforts at institutional reforms. Confronting authoritarianism means ensuring greater protection for political freedom, dynamic exchange of views, further improvement and empowerment of women, and proactive social justice agenda. Above all, good governance must remain the touchstone. It is true that conventional view on government legitimacy tend to put the emphasis on democratic rights, but general governance has emerged to take precedence. No one is suggesting that democratic rights are not essential, but their efficacy is preconditioned on good governance. Governance, therefore, must go beyond mere democracy and accountability. Here must go beyond mere electoral accountability. As Robert Dahl reminds us, there must be a constant capacity of the government to satisfy the citizens who are considered politically equals but executing the policies that correspond to their preferences. Solving a country's governance is therefore the key to attain quality democracy and this takes precedence over the economy. The view is that economic development without an equal economic and political playing field will be useless. Where massive corruption is not resolved, high economic growth will not be able to strengthen democracy. In fact, it will almost certainly lead to the erosion of rights and an increase in inequality. Bad governance breeds predatory states, which in turn produce predatory, predatory societies. The scenario in such societies is dominated by the ruling elite amassing wealth by exploiting a system devised by them. I find it rather perplexing, therefore, when I hear rhetoric about the persistence of the so-called illiberal democracy by apologists, analysts, and some academics. To suggest that a democracy which practices such undemocratic methods is still a democracy is certainly an affront to those struggling for freedom and justice and a denigration of the term itself. The ambivalence of advanced democracies in the light of these clear abuses of power, along which the tacit approval of the corporate sector and other international institutions is quite distressing. The survival of autocrats and dictators is largely due to the tacit approval of the West. This is a fact not lost on the people suffering un under these regimes. 
from the limited experience, militant experience, we have seen that the perpetrators of crime and corruption were either directly or indirectly endorsed by many Western governments and the business and the conglomerates. The plundering under the 1MDB, for example, could not have happened without the complicity in the crime by international financial institutions, and in this case, include Goldman Sachs. To quote my friend Larry Diamond, the spectre that is haunting democracy in the world today is bad governance. That means governance that serves only the interests of cronies and relatives and the political elite. It means patronage and the lack of transparency in the dispensation of government funds and projects. It means governance that turn a deaf ear to the demands for social justice. It means abuse of power and corruption. Ladies and gentlemen, in the 14th century, an Egyptian historian and Nuwairi included in his 30-volume encyclopedia a chapter on leadership and governance. Because it's 30 volume, I presume the generals in Egypt have not read them. In it, he said, and Nuwairi, a ruler must spread out a carpet of justice for his people. Erect a tent of security and fly the banners of forbearance with their fluttering tassels. He must pour, pour out rivers of charity for them, restraining the hands of inequity from reaching them while showering them with the rain clouds of noble deeds. The most important of the aforementioned qualities is justice. We made a pact to reject authoritarianism in all its guises. Thanks, Carl. The institutional reforms that has been set in motion are primed to take Malaysia on a new path of greater constitutional democracy and democratic accountability. Real changes do not come from mere slogans. Reform and social initiatives require total commitment, courage of conviction, and absolute integrity on the part of those who hold the reins of power. That's the real test of confronting authoritarianism and the only way to good governance and effective democracy. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that eloquent uh, speech. We now have some time for questions and answers. I think we should have microphones set up on either side of the room. And please, if you have a question, line up there. Actually, because of the lighting, it's a little hard to see. Um, yes. I didn't actually want to go Abroad. Well, three at a time. 
You want to take a few? Okay. We'll take a few then. Please. Uh, yes. Um, you spoke about unfettered capitalism and the risk that that uh, poses to democracy. And while I'm not 100% sure what unfettered capitalism is, I'm quite sure we don't have it today. Uh, wouldn't it be more accurate to talk in terms of um, elements of fascism and a fascist, um, ne or perhaps I should say a neo-fascist uh, movement going on in various parts of the world. I wouldn't want to confuse this with Nazism, but if you think of the early stages of Mussolini, and if you think, I mean, you were talking about India, and we can look here in the United States, Trumpism, I think you can draw some disturbing parallels. Thank you. Nice. <coughs> Uh, hello, Mr. Ibrahim. I'm Jay Kansar. I'm from the Hindu American Foundation. I met you in 2011 at Georgetown, and it's a pleasure to meet you again. I actually just went to Malaysia, and I met with uh, one of our mutual friends, Minister Weda Murthy. And unfortunately, Minister Murthy has come under a lot of fire because Prime Minister Mahathir had declared in his UN General Assembly speech just this past year that Malaysia would ratify the remaining conventions of the, uh, and one of those is the International Convention to End Racial Discrimination. And Way the Murthy was then put on the spot in Parliament, and unfortunately, the Prime Minister had to renounce his pledge to, uh, to pass this. And so I ask you, will you, if you become Prime Minister, pledge to uh, ratify the uh, International Convention to End Racial Discrimination and put, uh, or at least attempt to put an end to uh, discriminatory Bhumiputra policies in Malaysia that particularly discriminate uh, ethnic Indians and Chinese. Thank you. Thank you. Want a response? Yes. Yes. So, thank you. Now, <clears throat> now, issue of identity politics, I think, have been uh, Kwame Apaya and uh, Amatya Sen has uh, Spouse these views very strong, and I think um, there is of course role for diaspora communities all over the world. Um, they understand, in fact, better um, problems uh, that they experience in their own communities. But my position has always been that you, uh, the diaspora, can be better misleading because if you are American then you must, uh, of course, behave like an American. I mean, your priority is, of course, American politics. But your concern must be, of course, consistent and coherent, which means... Uh, now, I'm, I'm related to this, for example, there was a conference organized by the UK government and Turkish government some years back um, on uh, Islam in Europe. And, of course, our position, and I was one of the few outsiders outside Europe, asked to speak. I say, look, you must speak as a national of France or a European, not from the ghettos of Bangladesh outside Paris, because you will not present a, a fair uh, account and you will not, therefore, resonate with the um, citizens of that particular country. I mean, if you are ethnic Chinese or Indian in Malaysia, I would expect you to be first a Malaysian. But of course, you have every right to then bring up issues of concern uh, of, of uh, the ethnic Indians in Malaysia or the atrocities, if you believe, happen in India. I mean, that's my position. Now, which means you have a role. You all have a role because whatever criticism we have can levy against America, United States of America, you have a freedom to express your views here. And as I joke, Carl would remember this, that yes, there's no question of freedom in any part of the world. But there you have a freedom of speech, but never a freedom after speech. <laughs> Here, whatever criticism or limitations, you have freedom of speech and after speech, which means you must utilize this fully to express accounts and positions that affect all societies, regardless of race and creed. Now, on issue of unfettered capitalism, by that, I mean, you are right. There's no such thing, because you, are, you have rules, which means there are 
the limitations. But in fact, when you allow this plundering of wealth uh, and, and ignore completely problems of grinding poverty in the midst, you missed, or even gross inequality, the very criticism against excesses that has happened. My concern is not uh, against capitalism or market economy. My concern is because you allow a group of conglomerates to have such a pervasive influence on the administration, on policies, and the poor doesn't seem to be represented in any way. Policies always benefit the rich and the famous in the name of democracy or other uh, belief system. Now, the third question... Uh, now, um, right, so, so the issue of um, elements, yes, of fascism, of course, is a going concern. That's why I take great pride. I say, Alhamdulillah, thank God, that in Malaysia, you have Muslims, Chinese, uh, Buddhists, Hindus uh, coming together in an age where there's growing fascism. To an extent here, and some countries in Europe, there is this trend which is disconcerting, for disturbing, because in 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 the more uh, and the anti-immigration policies to the extreme, and and uh, the issue of uh, against the other, against other religions, uh, this uh, seems to be on the rise, on the increase, but in Malaysia, at least, you have observed in the last general elections something which is very promising. Majority Muslim country that proved that Islam is not incompatible to democracy, that the rule of law must be supreme and justice accorded to every single citizen. Now, the third question is regarding ISAT. It's not this issue ISAT. This is why I think those elites, the urban elites, must understand society. Who knows, I said, among the, among, among the 30 million people, is only discussed by the, uh, uh, the, the political elite. Now, before you introduce it, have us an effort to explain, interact. You talk yourself, you, you proclaim yourself to be Democrats, great Democrats. Then go down. Get the people to appreciate what you want. I support ISAT because it calls for justice and fights against all forms of discrimination. In fact, after the Malaysian government decided to reject ISAT because of the growing, growing controversy, in fact, the discussion on ISAT is to the contrary. It has led to more uh, contentious racial debates. The intention is anti-discrimination, but the result, because it was presented, and unfortunately also presented by a minister which has said some very disturbing uh, racist and religious bagot, uh, bagot uh, sort of a expression, they have caused concerns to others. I mean, this is a stark reality. You have to deal with it. You have to get, um, uh, a, uh, a, to, I mean, before you uh, enter or decide to have that, you have to explain. I move a motion in Parliament after the government rejected it to say, number one, Malaysia must remain committed to reject all forms of discrimination against race, religion, gender, and even regions, because the issue of regions be becomes quite an issue. So the rejection is only on the issue of giving time and space for people to deliberate further. Uh, and and, and uh, therefore, uh, the question of an economic policy uh, which favours the Malays is no longer relevant because the policy is now to support affirmative action. So what you hear is, you don't care about the issue of poverty and marginalization. You talk about 
no discrimination. So those poor and marginalized are concerned. Why did you talk about affirmative action based on need? Why don't you express concern about the poor? Not one race. The majority of the poor are the Malays. The majority of the poor in Malaysia, the marginalized, are the Malays. You better get the facts right. So, in order to have a position that you are anti any form of discrimination, don't discriminate against the poor. Make sure that we have policies in place, affirmative action, regardless of race. Pockets of poverty in the urban sector among the Chinese community, which must be addressed. Indian estate workers, the poor, must be handled. And the vast majority of the Malays and those in the rural heartland must be addressed. But you have position where people articulate only that the only poor in Malaysia are the Hindu Indians in the estates. That's absurd. Uh, to me, that's absurd. That will lead to a racial debate. How do we present it? We present it, look, we have to tackle the problem of poverty. Numbers, regions, regardless of their religious belief or race. This must be, to me, pronounced. Otherwise, there is now a new sense of insecurity among the majority who are poor. So I think it is a matter, uh, I said, if you talk about I said, if this is well explained, deliberated, and handled wisely from the beginning, and not pushed down the throats of the people, you may be right. Well, we want to be demo democratic. First, you have to get people to understand what democracy is about. You push down the throat, even if you mean well, don't care. people don't care a damn. You know, in 2008, I remember the more, uh, should say, uh, the, the elite within my party We talk. What's the agenda? We say we talk about judicial independence. We want a free media. We want a, an independent anti-corruption commission. Oh, this should be our agenda and go and campaign. You go to the rural poor and talk about, ladies and gentlemen, this country must be a vibrant democracy and we must have an independent judiciary. Oh, they clap. What did they see? What the heck is this fellow talking about? We don't have enough means to live. Not in the food, poor schools, no quality education, no access to medical attention. So I then change that. I say, look, we address first the problems of the people and say, look, it will be more effective to a democratic government. Because through democracy, you can speak up and challenge the policies adopted by this government. It's how we articulate the position. We tend to blame the masses. The arrogant elites. I say it's time for those in the urban areas, this arrogant bunch of elites, to take stock of our own limitations and failure and have the humility to acknowledge that we have had, we are partly contributive to this failure because we do not deal and address the problems of the common people. And, and for a democracy to work, we must address the issues and engage with the common people. I rest my case. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's take a couple more questions. I was doing a transaction with an uh, ethnic Chinese attorney uh, in, Mo in Kuala Lumpur uh, back in the mid-1990s, and when we went out to dinner, uh, the more he drank, uh, the more he uh, complained uh, about the situation which he alleged had developed, which is that when Malaysia uh, first gained independence, uh, the Chinese community was quite uh, prosperous and took no interest uh, in the military, and said, we don't need to do that. Uh, and. Uh, uh, then they took no interest in the government, uh, saying we're quite prosperous, we don't need to do that. And his claim was that after several decades, um, a number of um, uh, 
unfortunate situations uh, had been imposed uh, on the uh, uh, ethnic Chinese community uh, in Malaysia. Uh, I said, well, um, uh, did you see the, uh, the uh, attorney in my firm? I don't want to work with him, but I have to have him uh, in my firm. Uh, there are quotas uh, in the education system, and he cited several other things. Uh, were his allegations true back in the 1990s? And if they were, uh, have things changed? Okay. Let's take one or two more. I have a, just a very brief question based on the, for the second question, I think. Um, the for, one of the things you mentioned was uh, the fear of, of unfettered capitalism, which I sympathize with. However, um, based on ac activities in the region of Malaysia uh, and the Chinese government continuing to expand their uh, economic projects there, what would you say is the, the right balance between making sure that uh, human rights are sustained and working with the Chinese government on uh, initiatives such as the Belt and Road Initiative? Take I, I'll be brief. Um, I understand that in the March-April parliamentary session, the repeal of the Sedition Act will be coming up. I was wondering if you could comment on your views on the Sedition Act and also on the repeal of the death penalty. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's getting more difficult. <laughs> so normally, I, 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 for, I, I actually need to caution you before you ask questions that I have suffered immensely in prison. <laughs> Don't add on to that. Ask the difficult questions to the editors and to the Carl. Now, um, the, the concerns of the ethnic Chinese is true. In my party, my party is a multiracial party. And, and uh, the, uh, one of my uh, slogans in elections is uh, to have Malaysia, successful Malaysia, you must allow for the emergence of leaders who are really compassionate and considerate, who would consider, I like say, I will only be successful if I genuinely feel in that a Malay child is my child, a Chinese child is my child, or an Indian child is my child, that we are, after all, one big family woman to say each other. Um, that is can be a slogan, but it's appealing because people expect this, that to, to, to see this new change in sense of confidence. But it's not only a Malay problem. Some of the policies, for example, that favors the Malays in the common service. But you have also big Chinese conglomerates they ignore the presence of other races. So the Malay reaction would be, right, you complain about Malays in the civil service, but you don't care at all the fact that there are no, no Malay in the private sector, in your companies. And those employed in the private sector are much more. I would say, therefore, now, let us create this new awareness and sense of confidence that we should behave and act as Malaysians, support the meritocracy, fair, but there must be also affirmative action because a rural school in Kapit, Sarawak, cannot compete with a school in the capital city of Putrajaya or Kuala Lumpur. So you must have that sense, and I am optimistic that if you do dispense with justice, we will be able to resolve. The key term is still justice, and justice, according to Rawls again, is justice is fairness. You allow for opportunities for the poor, for the rich, and the marginalized to be able to participate and compete. Now. But having said that, you must remember that there's a change of government and change of policies. Now, without explanation, now instead of, and I said this in our um, party convention of the Alliance of Hope, 
I said, prior to the elections, we should address the concerns of the minorities. Post-elections, the Malays are feeling insecure because they say that all our policies are to favor the Chinese and the Indians. You can sense. So we will have to deal and navigate this to ensure that we are fair to the Malays, the Chinese, the Indians, and all the communities. And we cannot just uh, ignore this. Uh, if there are legitimate concerns, then we have to address. But the policy is no longer race-based. There's no way we should turn back. The policy must be based on needs. And it cannot turn back to the obsolete policies of the past. Now, the uh, issue of uh, unfettered, un unfettered capitalism and uh, projects with China. Projects with China, we encourage trade and investments with China, as with, with the United States in all countries. But we have had, unfortunately, some <coughs> bad experience in terms of the mega projects with the Chinese. So uh, Dr. Mahathir, as the Prime Minister, have announced that we need to renegotiate or even cancel if we find and deem that these projects are dubious or corrupt. So uh, that is the stage now. Do we then stop engaging with the Chinese? No. Do we then discourage investments with the Chinese? No. Do we then accept conditions that the participation will be at the expense of human rights or democracy? No. Where the Chinese have not imposed their condition to us. But the specific projects, the mega project, I told the Chinese, I met the leaders of the Communist Party and said, look, uh, we are all for it, but then we can't afford it. Number one. Number two, some of the deals, we find it rather dubious and you, over, uh, you expect us to overpay. Yes, there was an agreement between the, ex, uh, the past regime. But I told the Chinese, look, there is groundswell of Malaysians rejecting the leadership because of corruption. And therefore, we cannot continue with projects that is deemed to be dubious or complicit in the corrupt arrangements. So that is the stage we are negotiating. Hopefully, we will be able to resolve. Now, issue of uh, Sedition Act, of course, we have taken a position. We do not agree, although there are some concerns saying that do we then allow a complete uh, attack against the royalty uh, who, who have no uh, avenue to respond because they don't engage in a political debate. So these are issues that will be addressed. I think uh, not lay majesty, in fact, that you can't criticize, but at least to have some protection uh, for those who are not able to respond to criticisms by political leaders. But Sedition Act, which means, uh, which is, of course, which we, we inherit from the British during the colonial period, uh, during the period of the battle against communist insurgents, uh, cannot be supported which means it has to be repealed. Secondly, on the issue of um, death penalty, uh, this is only uh, the other concern. You see. Uh, I, I would suggest that we take it in stages. For example, there's death penalty, mandatory death penalty for drug traffickers. Not, not the Filipino method. <laughs> I'm talking about uh, through the uh, courts. But uh, most of us feel the mandatory uh, death penalty cannot be supported. But uh, that's to me the stage that we should be in. That the second stage to be more selective because there's ground um, swell of expression of anger when we say to do away with that penalty fully because many of the murder and rape victims start sending memos. My daughter was raped and murdered. So it's a very sensitive, uh, emotional issue we have to deal with. So uh, again, uh, our problem, as I said, like I said, which is a good convention, but without proper explanation, 
you go force your way down the throats of people, you'll find this reaction. So from the experience of my cert, we realize that there's a need to go back to the paper, look, for drug addiction, there should, have, should be a general consensus of support. Although some have strong views, they say, look, you say it's not murder, but you uh, provide um, some big business cartel on drug uh, trafficking, then you indirectly kill people. That's one argument, but we dispute that. So our position is, for this, we should repeal the uh, mandatory uh, death sentence. But for some specific areas, like rape and murder, we say, okay, we'll do a second stage and look at the intricacies of the law. I think as long as we progress in that direction, not to the dictate of some one or two civil society organizations or capitals of the West, I don't think that should be a mechanism. We should understand and appreciate the sensitivities of our people as long as we move forward at stages. For example, parliamentary session goes every other every quarter, or no, no, five, six sessions a year. Next session, sedition, and death penalty for, uh, to repeal the death penalty for drug trafficking. And we still have an August session, a November session. And I don't think that in one session we should repeal all the laws without proper effort to disseminate information and to engage the people. Sometimes I have a problem because dealing with this question because we talk, uh, I mean, we, we believe in democracy. Uh, we talk about uh, aspirations of our people. But who are the people? We. Who decide? We. I mean, it's a new form of uh, more sophisticated dictatorship. I think uh, we should have the humility to engage and discuss. Although issues like this is part of our manifesto, which we must move forward. I'm convinced that in many areas, death penalty must be repealed. That's my personal view. But I don't think that I would give, in three months, I would repeal all of those. I would still want uh, you know, town hall sessions, engagement with the people, and move progressively in that direction. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> we only have a little time left. I want to also ask you to say a little bit more about the transition and why it was able to occur in such a peaceful way. There wasn't more resistance from those who lost. But let me, there are two people standing. If you could each try to make your question as concise as possible, and then we'll finish with uh, Anwar's replies to the three. Well, uh, my name is Dolkun Isa. I'm the Uyghur, uh, and from the World Uyghur Congress based, uh, based in Germany. Well, uh, we all know today China is the most powerful uh, authoritarian uh, government, dictatorship government. Today, one to three million Uyghurs are in 21st century concentration camps are suffering. But most of the uh, world is silenced, particularly Muslim world, still a silence. Uh, uh, but your first uh, Muslim leader uh, speak out and right was Uyghur and the condemns Chinese policy towards the Uyghurs. And yesterday, and uh, secondly, Turkish foreign ministry speak out, broken the silence finally. This all uh, very encouraged to the Uyghur people and they bring the some uh, moral support. Uh, but still, Excuse most me, of some, yes, yeah, most of some Muslim countries still silenced. You know the Muslim leader very well than us. What is the reason why they are still silenced? And uh, what we can do? Second question is, what is your message if you meet Xi Jinping soon in future? Thank you. <laughs> and last one. Yes. Uh, Sri, thank you so much for coming here tonight. My name is Peek and I'm from Malaysia, so it's quite good to have you here tonight. Um, my question is um, on um, part of Mahathir's book, uh, The Malay Dilemma, and one of the sections that he writes about is uh, about kind of this, this notion of the lazy Malay, the, na the lazy native. And in one, one of the anecdotes that he gives or he alludes to is uh, uh, if there's gold in a kampung house, uh, a Chinese person will go and dig it down themselves and reap all the profits. But if a Malay person 
uh, finds it, then they'll hire somebody to do it for them. My uh, question for you is, what is your response to that kind of uh, idea? And what is your, in your experience, your experiences um, as a Malay man and knowing Malay people, what is their true character? Um, just speaking to that, what the Prime Minister said. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, I think uh, the issue of transition, how is it uh, that it could happen in Malaysia, is not spontaneous. Um, I cannot claim that we began <laughs> only in 98 with the reformacy after I was uh, imprisoned. I think even in dissidents, people are more alert. Social media had its role, um, middle class elements and civil society played their role. Uh, in 2013, as you could recall, we um, garnered 52% of the popular vote. And in electoral process, that is clearly fraudulent. Fortunately, they did not learn from Iraq or Egypt those days because um, uh, there was a story in Iraq that um, during the days of Saddam, they went to vote. Then when they went back to the house, they told, he, this, this guy told the parents, said, yeah, I voted against Saddam. So the parents said, you are mad. You know that we will not survive this. Can you... You, you will. Uh, you have permitted a major blunder at our expense. So this young guy said, "Okay, Mama, I'll make the correction." So he went back to the polling station and told the the, the polling chief, uh, "I made a mistake. I think I was confused. I thought uh, voting means this, then that. Uh, so what do you do? I didn't support Saddam. So what do you want to do? I want to support Saddam. Oh, just don't worry. We have corrected that." <laughs> so, uh, so then, I mean, <laughs> so that is what uh, elections is all about in some places. Uh, so in our case, it went on. In, you remember in, in 2013, we have had that, but then we didn't have enough seats because of gerrymandering, etc., etc. But anyway, we considered after the big battle, we, I did consider. I said, look, we want a peaceful... Uh, the country must be peaceful. I don't want civil strife. All the, our initial decision, in fact, many of the younger, our younger supporters were very angry with me at that time. They wanted us to continue to oppose the government because they're not legitimate. But, you know, you expect Muslim countries, they've got silent. Even Western countries, because of a lot of interest, business interests in Malaysia. So they were also silent. But anyway, uh, that has caused this uh, activists and Democrats to work harder and I say that you should not win in a particular constituency if you win by 51% of the votes you will lose so you must make sure that the margin goes higher must be 4 or 5% to register victory and, uh, to, uh, we did achieve that finally but how why is it that the leadership of the old uh, regime concede. I should. I think we should grant them some. Uh, how should I say recognition, because they tried. For what I hear, they did try. Uh, but uh, we were fortunate because the police and the army just decided to follow, respect the will of the majority, and uh, therefore the transition was peaceful. Um, there were, of course, problems because the old uh, officers, the old loyalties were there, but it, no, it, it's not certainly a, 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 a problem that could, could lead to uh, civil strife. And uh, Mahathir's experience also count in this accident. Um, it's not easy for me to praise him, but I think uh, <laughs> uh, to do justice to the facts, he did. Uh, maneuver because I was still technically in prison at that time. I was not able to influence uh, the, the direction, but he did. Uh, and, and that gave some semblance of confidence that this man had this experience, at least in, to govern and give him the chance to do it. 
Now, on the question of Igor, uh, Igor yes, I did uh, express my views and I did meet uh, Communist Party, Chinese Communist Party leaders and express some of our concern because they say, of course, we must also listen to their side of the story, not only Western propaganda. I say I did not uh, express my views based on Western propaganda, but from the facts, uh, from the meeting I had with Yigur uh, leaders and representat representatives. So I have uh, done in a small way, and um, Malaysians, uh, I mean, to credit both or the previous government too and the present government, we have said that uh, whilst we do not uh, necessarily condone any perpetrators of violence in any way, but the issue of uh, uh, Uyghur is not all terrorism or violence. There are peaceful elements within the community, uh, and uh, we must at least show some concern. I mean, Turkey has taken a very strong uh, position. Now, you say that why are the Muslim uh, countries muted? What do you expect them to do? You mean uh, you expect Assad to say something? <laughs> or, or Sisi? So, I'm <laughs> so you, you don't expect too much. Uh, because um, Sisi would say that I am uh, appalled by the way you treat your citizens. <laughs> they can't say that. You know? <laughs> so, um, to my mind, you have to take a position, and we are appreciative of the fact that the United States and some Western governments have also expressed their views, uh, and, and we hope there's immediate amicable resolution to this conflict, that the Chinese will take into account the concerns expressed, not all by their political force, but many of their friends in the region, to try and resolve this conflict. On the issue of Malay Dilemma, this was, uh, well, in the old issue, Mahathir wrote it in 19, uh, 1969. He has revised his views, and why are you stuck with the old views? <laughs> um, like when I was in, um, lect I gave a lecture at the Council of Foreign Relations, I think, in New York, many years back. Oh, so I know you sound quite liberal and quite democratic now. And then he cited, uh, he quoted what I said. When? When I was 17. I see. Yeah, I may have said that. I can't remember. But, but why did you choose uh, some of the nasty things that I said when I was 11? <laughs> uh, so I think um, the Mahathir's position on the Malay is not... I mean, he believed... One thing is he believed that the culture and the values must change with the times. But you know, there has been a strong academic debate one of the most uh, pronounced uh, sociologists in the region, Hussein Alatas, wrote a book, The Myth of the Lazy Native. You see, uh, in the influence of very colonial scholars, you have that myth. You talk about uh, the Chinese has a propensity to be, uh, to like opium. But certainly it's absurd. But that was the colonial attitude that was pervasive in that period. Jose Rizal, I, who am I consider a great hero, a precursor of Asian Renaissance on the Philippines, he wrote in the 1860s, I believe, the indolence of the Filipinos, the prejudice that the Filipinos are generally indolent and lazy. Mind you, this is 2019. It must be supported by serious study. There's none that could defend that position. Then any particular culture, whether it's Red Indian or ethnic blacks, those days, you remember the studies about uh, the whites and the blacks, how inferior the blacks are or were? I mean, these, are, these have been condemned. India, how the... The British look at the Indians. There have been studies on this to debunk that thesis. You don't give them opportunities. You leave them in the rural jungles and you expect them to compete with those in the cities. They can compete. Why do you compete running in the jungle? 
they will win. <laughs> or climbing up trees. So, but, but you want to compete in modern education and technology, you must bring and give opportunities. That's why I quoted roles about justice as fairness. You must allow communities to um, get facilities, opportunities in order to compete fairly and squarely. So you have meritocracy on one side, you have affirmative action on the other. Then there will be peace and harmony. I must thank you again thank and you. thank you for this opportunity. <laughs>